The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Vignette 9, Louis, his cousin, and his other cousin. Downstairs from Mimi's is a basement apartment that Mimi's mother fixed up and rented to a Puerto Rican family, Louis's family. Louis is the oldest in a family of little sisters. He is my brother's friend, really, but I know he has two cousins and that his t-shirts never stay tucked in his pants. Louis's girl cousin is older than us. She lives with Louis's family because her own family is in Puerto Rico. Her name is Marin or Maris or something like that, and she wears dark nylons all the time and lots of makeup she gets free from selling Avon. She can't come out, got to babysit with Louis's sisters. But she stands in the doorway a lot, all the time singing, clicking her fingers, the same song. Apples, peaches, pumpkin pie, yeah. You're in love and so am I, yeah. Louis has another cousin. We only saw him once, but it was important. We were playing volleyball in the alley when he drove up in this great big yellow Cadillac with white walls and a yellow scarf tied around the mirror. Louis's cousin had his arm out the window. He honked a couple of times and a lot of faces looked out from Louis's back window and then a lot of people came out. Louis, Marin, and all the little sisters. Everybody looked inside the car and asked where he got it. There were white rugs and white leather seats. We all asked for a ride and asked where he got it. Louis's cousin said, get in. We each had to sit with one of Louis's little sisters on our laps, but that was okay. The seats were big and soft like a sofa, and there was a little white cat in the back window whose eyes lit up when the car stopped or turned. The windows didn't roll up like ordinary cars. Instead, there was a button that did it for you automatically. We rode up the alley and around the blocks six times, but Louis's cousin said he was going to make us walk home if we didn't stop playing with the windows or touching the FM radio. The seventh time we drove into the alley, we heard sirens. Real quiet at first, but then louder. Louis's cousin stopped the car right where we were and said, everybody out of the car. Then he took off, flooring that car into a yellow blur. We hardly had time to think when a cop car pulled in the alley going just as fast. We saw the yellow Cadillac at the end of the block trying to make a left-hand turn, but our alley is too skinny and the car crashed into a lamppost. Marin screamed, and we ran down the block to where the cop's car's sirens spun a dizzy blue. The nose of that yellow Cadillac was all pleated like an alligator's, and except for a bloody lip and a bruised forehead, Louis's cousin was okay. They put handcuffs on him and put him in the back seat of the cop car, and we all waved as they drove away. Vignette 10, Marin. Marin's boyfriend is in Puerto Rico. She shows us his letters and makes us promise not to tell anybody they're going to get married when she goes back to Puerto Rico. She says he didn't get a job yet, but she's saving the money she gets from selling Avon and taking care of her cousins. Marin says that if she stays here next year, she's going to get a real job downtown because that's where the best jobs are, since you always get to look beautiful and get to wear nice clothes and can meet someone in the subway who might marry you and take you to live in a big house far away. But next year, Louis's parents are going to send her back to her mother with a letter saying she's too much trouble. And that's too bad because I like Marin. She's older and knows lots of things. She's the one who told us how David, the baby's sister, got pregnant and what cream is best for taking off mustache hair. And if you count the white flicks on your fingernails, you can know how many boys are thinking of you. And lots of other things I can't remember now. We never see Marin until her aunt comes home from work. And even then, she can only stay out in front. She is there every night with the radio. With the light in her aunt's room goes out, Marin lights a cigarette and it doesn't matter if it's cold out or if the radio doesn't work or if we've got nothing to say to each other. What matters, Marin says, is for the boys to see us and for us to see them. And since Marin's skirts are shorter and since her eyes are pretty, and since Marin is already older than us in many ways, the boys who do pass by say stupid things like, I am in love with those two green apples you call eyes. Give them to me, why don't you? And Marin just looks at them without even blinking and is not afraid. Marin, under the streetlight, dancing by herself, is singing the same song somewhere I know, is waiting for a car to stop, a star to fall, someone to change her life. Vignette 11, Those Who Don't. Those who don't know any better come into our neighborhood scared. They think we're dangerous. They think people, we will attack them with skinny knives. They are stupid people who are lost and got here by mistake. But we aren't afraid. We know the guy with the crooked eye is Davy, the baby's brother. 
And the tall one next to him in the straw brim, that's Rosa's Eddie V. And the big one that looks like a dumb grown man, he's fat boy, though he's not fat anymore, nor a boy. All brown, all around, we are safe. But watch us drive into a neighborhood of another color, and our knees go shakety-shake, and our car windows get rolled up tight, and our eyes look straight. Yeah, that is how it goes and goes. Vignette 12. There was an old woman. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Rosa Vargas's kids are too many and too much. It's not her fault, you know, except she is their mother and only one against so many. They are bad, those Vargases. And how can they help it with only one mother who is tired all the time from budding and bottling and babying and who cries every day for the man who left without even leaving a dollar for baloney or a note explaining how come? The kids bend trees and bounce between cars and dangle upside down from the knees and almost break like fancy museum vases you can't replace. They think it's funny. They are without respect for all things living, including themselves. But after a while, you get tired of being worried about kids who aren't even yours. One day, they're playing chicken on Mr. Benny's roof. Mr. Benny says, hey, ain't you kids no better than to be swinging up there? Come down. You come down right now. And then they just spit. See, that's what I mean. No wonder everybody gave up. Just stopped looking out when little Efron chipped his buck tooth on a parking meter and didn't even stop when Refugia from her getting her head stuck between two slats in the back gate. And nobody looked up, not once, the day Angel Vargas learned to fly and dropped from the sky like a sugar donut, just like a falling star and exploded down to earth without even an oh. Vignette 13, Alicia who sees mice. Close your eyes and they'll go away, her father says, or you're just imagining. And anyway, a woman's place is sleeping so she can wake up early with a tortilla star, the one that appears early just in time to rise and catch the hind legs hide behind the sink. Beneath the four-clawed tub, under the swollen floorboards, nobody fixes in the corner of your eyes. Alicia, whose mama died, is sorry there is no one older to rise and make the lunchbox tortillas. Alicia, who inherited her mama's rolling pin and sleepiness, is young and smart and studies for the first time at university. Two trains and a bus, because she doesn't want to spend her whole life in a factory or behind a rolling pin. Is a good girl, my friend, studies all night and sees the mice. The ones her father says do not exist, is afraid of nothing except four-legged fur and fathers. <laughs>